everyone, and welcome to the first edition of the Conversational AI Fest. I'm Claudia Campos, Product Marketing Manager for ChatLayer by Cinch, and I'll be your host today. For those who don't know yet what ChatLayer is, ChatLayer is the Conversational AI platform of Cinch, and Cinch is a global CPaaS leader that enables businesses to reach anyone in the planet through mobile messaging, email, and voice and video. It also allows businesses to create great conversational experiences with their customers through the power of AI. Today, we're going to focus mainly on conversational AI topics. We have such amazing speakers for you, trust me. I've seen already some of their presentations and I can tell that they've prepared very interesting sessions for you, so don't miss them. But before we start with our first session, I would like to give you a short introduction of the platform and the activities that will happen during the event. First of all, I want to tell you that for each session, there will be time for Q&As at the end of the session. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat of the stage so we can answer them later on. The stage area is where the live sessions will happen and is exactly where you are right now. Also, for each session, there will be a mini survey to fill in after the session so we can get your thoughts and feedback about it. If you can't join a live session during the day, don't worry, because all the sessions will be recorded and sent to you by email after the event. Last but not least, we will have a 90-minute lunch break starting at 12.30 p.m., and during this time, you will have the option to join the networking session. This session will be specifically for you to connect and interact directly with other speakers and other attendees. At the end of the event, we're going to have the after party networking session that will happen around 5 p.m. But I'll be sharing with you more information about those networking sessions around noon. For now, let's start with the first session of the day that will be given by Rick Van Ask, the Vice President of the SaaS Business Unit at Cinch. Rick, thanks a lot for joining us today. I know it's very early for you since you're joining us from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So thanks a lot for being here. Well, I'm uh, super happy to be here. Can everybody hear me? All good. All uh, right. Rick, you will, you will open the day with a very interesting topic, the AI paradox and how artificial intelligence will make us more human. I'm already curious to know more about it. So welcome, Rick, and over to you. All right, great. So again, thank you so much for having me today. And I'm super, super thrilled uh, to be here at Conversational AI Fest 2022. Um, as you said, Claudia, I'm today dialing in from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and oh boy, what a amount of energy that I've seen here around this topic being conversational AI. Um, in the next 30 minutes, what I actually want to do is make sure that we'll talk about what we call the AI paradox. Because a lot of people are asking me, well, um, chat layer is all about artificial intelligence, but what does it mean for us uh, humans? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk a bit more about uh, during the next session. So again, be very welcome. Uh, we're super glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Rick. Uh, I've spent the last five years of my career uh, in this topic, in conversational and in AI. And it has been an amazing journey. Um, back in 2018, 2017, when we started to do some projects for clients, this was really at its infancy. If we're looking today, it's really an industry. It's becoming huge and it's going, going to grow every, every, every year. So what I'm going to do right now during this session is I'm going to walk you through in the beginning for the first five to 10 minutes through some conversational trends, setting the scene with you, what we see happening around the globe. And then we're going to talk about what AI means uh, for us humans, um, so that you have an idea about that. So the first thing that I want to mention is that conversation is really fully happening. It's truly a global phenomenon. Um, if you look at the breadth of use cases that we are currently providing uh, around the globe as Singe, and also in all the different countries that we're providing them, um, that's really a proof, a testimony of this global phenomenon. Whether you are in Germany, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Belgium, whether you're in India, or even in Africa, 
uh, nowadays the way that people decide to communicate with businesses. Um, they prefer to communicate in a conversational way. Now, what I want to show you today is basically how convers uh, conversational and uh, artificial intelligence are basically coming together uh, in conversational AI. Um, and what is important to know for you, because it is a global problem, that the world is evolving fast and that we have different, I would say, competence centers or hubs that we call them, that are fueling this new revolution. So on the left side of the map, you see, for instance, Silicon Valley, which is definitely uh, an AI hub. Today, I'm calling in from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. That's really a conversation hub. A channel like WhatsApp has a huge uh, market penetration, and a lot of people are using it in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives uh, to buy uh, services, to buy goods on, for instance, WhatsApp. Also in the middle, Africa is a very important market. Think, for instance, about Kenya. Kenya was one of the first to do mobile payments, payments on a mobile phone. Think about the M-Pisa scheme that they invented uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, so an important market as well uh, when it comes to conversational. And then India and China as well, uh, huge markets in a Asia that are embracing it. Today, we'll not talk about, uh, too much about China uh, because China is a, is a bit, I would say, on its own but know that they're both a conversational and an AI app with, uh, with Tencent and WeChat, for instance, um, that uh, bring both together AI and, and conversational. So if we look at the world from a conversational perspective, this is a bit how the world looks like. Uh, all the countries in green or light green are WhatsApp, all the countries in, in light blue are Facebook. Uh, and uh, yeah, you have some, some different uh, other channels as well. Think about Fiber, think about WeChat, Line, Telegram. Um, there's actually a very small uh, yellow um, region as well. Uh, if you look at uh, south of um, uh, um, Korea, uh, and that's actually a, a region that is dominated by uh, Kakao Talk uh, that we also support with Singe. Uh, we're supporting that currently for uh, some luxury goods uh, where uh, South Koreans love to buy goods on, on Kakao Talk. Uh, if you want to have something fun to talk uh, about with your friends or with your colleagues in the in the coming days, I suggest that you download the app. Uh, you have a flavor there. You have an app that maybe uh, you don't use yet and that you can show uh, to your friends. So a lot of fun. But uh, this is how the world looks like. And um, yeah, that's really what we're seeing in the market as well. Now, one of the major, major trends that we've been seeing unfolding for the last 12 months is that uh, the conversational user experience is no longer touching only on the customer care side. When we started with ChatLayer five years ago, it was basically a contact center that would ask us, hey, can you automate some of the conversations that we're having in an asynchronous way? What they meant was, hey, can we use live chat with a sort of a messaging functionality, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, or very often just web chat uh, in order to take away some of uh, the volume of, of uh, um, yeah, uh, tickets they needed to handle. If we look at the last 12 months, we see that that's basically blurring. What we're seeing is that more and more in the conversational space, uh, people want to do marketing campaigns. They want to make purchases possible on the conversational channels, like a WhatsApp, uh, and then they want to take care of the customers later on. So this is a huge shift that we're seeing. Um, and I think it's a, yeah, a big opportunity for everybody who's in the market uh, to use that to communicate in a very, very conversational way with our customers. And to give an example, I'm currently in Sao Paulo. If I would right now order food, I would order food uh, through iFood. And iFood is a, is a major customer of us. Uh, and basically what they do um, is that uh, you can order food uh, through WhatsApp. Um, and that's, that's a really, really, really cool way. Um, but they also have lots of other different use cases. They do about 282 different use cases with us uh, to do surveys, to do marketing campaigns, to, do, to send coupons, for instance, uh, in a conversational way so that people get get discount uh, on their next meal. And this is a bit how that looks, right? So iFood uses WhatsApp as a sales channel. So you can just order your food through WhatsApp. You can select uh, the food. Uh, and you can even pay using Apple Pay, using Google Pay uh, directly uh, in, in, in the app. And I think that's, that's just amazing uh, what we're seeing. Why is it so important for iFood? Well, um, 
wherever you go here in Brazil, every uh, restaurant or family owned restaurant or chain restaurant, um, what they basically have is they have an advertisement with the number that they're showing uh, outside, the WhatsApp number. And basically by sending them a message, you can order uh, food there. Um, so for iFood is extremely important that um, they also have access to this channel because basically, um, yeah, they're in somewhat in condition with uh, local uh, uh, restaurants. Um, and as they are offering their service to WhatsApp, they cannot stand, uh, yeah, stand without, they cannot go without. They're also currently working with us to bring a technology platform so that smaller restaurants can use WhatsApp to make sure that everybody stays within the ecosystem. So again, uh, one big example of the importance of conversational in a market like Brazil. Now, Brazil is not the only uh, market where conversational is important. Uh, in the meanwhile, in India, um, I don't know if you know these type of shops, but they're called a Kirana in India. It's a family owned uh, business and it's basically a, a grocery shop, a small grocery shop where everybody goes after work and uh, collects uh, the, the food that they want to eat at the evening uh, or uh, something to drink or whatever. Um, and one of the things that, um, that a company called Geo has recently done with Meta is uh, make it very easy to buy groceries uh, with these Karanas. And I'm going to show you a video right now on how that experience looks. So isn't that amazing? The experience that you saw, the truly conversational experience that you saw, uh, and there's a lot of technology in the back making that happening. To talk about the technology, let's talk a bit more about artificial intelligence. Because over the last five years that I've been in the industry, I heard a lot of people that had questions about it. And to be frank, a lot of people, they have a lot of concerns about AI. Will AI replace my job? Will AI be become more dominant than us as the human race. All of these questions have been asked uh, me to the team, etc. And I want to give you in the next 15 minutes a bit of an overview about how we believe that the future uh, is going to be with AI. And I'm hoping to convince you that the future is actually quite, quite nice with AI. Um, but uh, I'll leave that judgment to you after 15 minutes. So a lot of you probably know um, the developments that have been made in AI. Uh, AI is a field that was invented in the 50s, 60s um, as, as, as a new technology field. Um, but basically to the main public, it has become more and more known during the middle 90s. And it's basically uh, by playing games. Uh, AI has been very good in playing games. You see some of the examples here. So for instance, uh, Kasparov, the famous chess player, was defeated by IBM's Deep Blue. Um, uh, IBM's Watson has, for instance, in a TV quiz, uh, uh, won at a, a game that's very popular in the US, in, in Jeopardy. Um, and also recently, um, it was Google's DeepMind uh, who won uh, against Lee Sidol uh, for uh, the, the game Go. And Go, uh, in terms of possibilities, in terms of complexity, is like one of the most complex games uh, in the world. And AI basically beat the human. And this makes us human feel very fragile. It feels like, uh, okay, some of the things that humans were really good at, 
now AI is basically beating us. They're, it's kicking our, and I will not uh, say that word. Um, so very often it was said like, okay, but what's really human? Uh, so maybe creativity is very human. Now, for instance, in the below, uh, uh, the, the IAB Mix Awards in 2017, there, there were um, a lot of AI, um, yeah, uh, creative type of um, art uh, submitted. And actually an independent jury uh, selected the AI art as being the most beautiful one. So also in terms of creativity, there are more and more uh, examples of AI doing really, really good and uh, sometimes outperforming a human being. Uh, we also have seen that with composing of music, we've seen that with pictures, paintings, etc., etc., etc. So a lot of people come then to me like, oh, Rick, um, you're responsible for conversational AI within Singe, so you must know AI a bit. So aren't you worried that you're actually at the forefront uh, of uh, making it happen that we humans are no, no longer needed anymore. Um, and um, for me, this is a really funny question because five years ago, when uh, people would talk to me and I would say that I'm in the conversational AI space, then they said, in what space are you? Uh, and then I said, well, uh, you know, a chatbot that you use on the website. And then they started laughing at me because typically the chatbot experience back then, they weren't that good. Um, I still remember that our CTO was talking about um, yeah, how chatbots suck. I also know that later on today, uh, one of our partners is going to talk about uh, yeah, why a lot of chatbots still today are not giving the best user experience. But um, today, the discussion is completely opposite. Today, uh, during June 2022, um, in Silicon Valley, there was actually a Google engineer that was so convinced that the AI, the, the natural language processing, so the AI that's working with the language, um, it was so good that they actually thought it came to life and it was actually able to reason and to think like a human. Now, in the end, after a lot of investigation, etc., that was of course not true, but it shows how far that we are uh, evolving. That the Turing test, uh, so the test to, to define, okay, is it a near human experience, um, uh, the way that you converse with the mean? And I know also uh, our head of AI, Frederik, will tell a bit more about that today. Um, that's coming really, really, really close. So we can almost have near human interactions uh, with machines. But if you then think about the time that it took us to get there and all the steps that we had to do, um, it's just a logical consequence, you know. Um, when in the 1800s you wanted to uh, communicate, you either sent a letter uh, or you went by foot or you went by a horse and you delivered a message. In, in the best case, you had a pigeon that you could you could send over. And then in the early 1900s and 1800s, um, there was something amazing like a phone, right? A, a phone that uh, people could use and it took a while to roll that out. And that was basically perfected, perfected, perfected. Um, so that you use an IVR. So it's like press one uh, to speak to this uh, department press two to be helped with your customer query, et cetera, et cetera. That only got invented in the 1980s, so 80 years after that the phone was invented. And then of course, internet made a lot of other things uh, possible. For AI and machine learning, and that's on the top uh, in green, yeah, it has also been an, uh, yeah, a, 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 road, a road to where we are today with a lot of different experiments, with a lot of uh, different um, uh, yeah, experiments, different ways of testing out. Uh, but AI advanced and conversational work uh, is coming together. So where are we today uh, in conversational uh, experiences? Well, um, the truth is, according to Gartner, we're at the below bottom. We're currently going to the true of the trough of disillusionment. Um, when we started three, uh, three, four years ago, uh, it was actually at the peak of inflated expectations. And we saw that a lot of companies were for uh, testing the technology. There are other uh, areas as well that we work with. Natural language processing is, is going to the same process. But if you look at AI, general AI, for instance, so AI that can, can do multiple tasks and can almost reason like human beings, Gardner still estimates that that's more than 10 years off. Um, and one of the things that I found super funny I want to share with you is um, also the um, trend of machine customers, right? So machines buying from machines instead of humans buying from humans. Uh, that's something that uh, Gartner thinks is still 
uh, 10 years off. Now, today it already is happening to some extent because some printers, they can uh, order um, uh, inkjet uh, from, uh, from, from a website. So it's actually the printer who is linked with your credit card is sending um, the, um, the order uh, for, for new inkjet. Uh, but there are very, very small cases. But back to uh, chatbots, we're going to the true of disillusionment. Um, and then a lot of people say, yeah, uh, on, the, on the other spectrum, that's, that's, that's another type of, of audience that I speak to. Well, Rick, I mean, uh, conversational AI is just like, it, it just doesn't work, you know. And what I don't always say is like, yeah, look, guys, but this is very normal for a new technology. I don't know if anybody here in the room still remembers a PDA. Eh? So personal digital assistant was like a big mini computer that you had in your pocket um, that was launched in uh, the beginning of the 2000s. It was a complete failure. It didn't work. Why didn't uh, it work? Well, because a lot of like the surrounding technology that you needed um, and also the easiness to work with a PDA was not there. There was no um, Wi-Fi everywhere or, or 2, 3, 4, 5G in order to connect anywhere. If you flash forward in 2007, then the company Apple, they basically uh, took a lot of those constraints away. But if you look at the iPhone uh, that was uh, delivered back then, in terms of functionality, in terms of capability, it wasn't that different as a PDA. So, um, and what we've been seeing since 2007 is that we have this huge plateau of productivity for smartphones and it's still going. Uh, I think next year is one of the first years that we'll actually see a decrease in new smartphones being produced because everybody in the world already has a smartphone. So it's the expectation that also conversational AI is on that, that uh, all the forecasts of the analysts point in that direction. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is that the AI is getting better and better and better and is going to help to uh, go to the plateau of productivity. But then the question is, so what does this all mean for us humans? Because conversational AI is going to take uh, yeah, a lot of uh, the human uh, interaction that we're having with customers. And the thing that I want to say is that and, and if there's one thing that you need to remember from this, um, from this uh, keynote is that AI will specialize in thinking. It's very good in thinking, being rational, being uh, cognitive, etc. We humans, we specialize in feeling. And that's what I'm going to talk about you know, a bit more. So if we look at intelligence or if you look at intelligence from a, um, uh, an academic point of view, uh, it basically has multiple levels. You can have like a sort of a mechanical um, intelligence. And so think about a, a simple machine that is producing uh, something. You can have analytical intelligence. So think about, for instance, um, yeah, a basic assessment that is being made or that you're uh, doing a sort of a formula in Excel. You can do intuitive intelligence as well. Intuitive intelligence is where machine learning already gets in. You use basically um, yeah, things uh, process that you see in nature, uh, neurologic processes in order to, to make intuitive assessments without you knowing actually why you're making the assessment. Uh, but what is considered as highest level of intelligence is the empathetic uh, or the feeling um, um, intelligence. And that's what we humans are really, really good at. I then get the question like, okay, Rick, that's all fine. It's all academic, but what does it mean for, for, for my job? What does it mean for our economy? Well, it means that over time we will evolve to a feeding economy. And if you think about what your grandparents were doing or their parents were doing, they were doing physical jobs. They were in a physical economy, whether that meant that they were, would work on the land in order to get uh, the... Um, the vegetables or worked with, with, with the animals on the farm, or whether they worked in a factory. Uh, I leave that in the middle, but it was a physical economy. The way to earn money or to get value uh, from your labor was by, by doing physical activity. For the last 60, 70 years, that has shifted into a thinking economy. So instead of like working hard and doing the labor, it's about the idea that you're, ha you're having. Um, and it's also about how you can interpret data and what you can make out of the data. My forecast right now is that we're moving towards a feeling economy. So the thinking economy will increasingly be taken over by AI. It uh, doesn't mean that you don't need to think anymore as a human being, but the part feeling is going to uh, make us stand out uh, from the machines. And this will have a lot of repercussions. Um, 
because you can ask yourself, okay, what does it mean for technical skills? Do I still need to be able to code, for instance, or do I, for instance, still need to be able to, to make all the data analysis that I used to have? It also means that people who are maybe a bit illiterate or people who have difficulties with, um, with writing or difficulties with, with um, uh, reading, that actually just by saying things, they can instruct the machine and they can get things done. But also it means that um, there is something interesting going on uh, around gender. There's a lot of people uh, coming to me like, okay, what does AI mean for gender? Uh, because we saw AI being racist in the past, uh, uh, etc. Well, actually, if you think about this whole economy uh, uh, part, the uh, uh, economy, it actually gives, for instance, women a big advantage uh, in the future because um, the physical economy was mainly dominated by men. But the feeling economy, the, the empathy um, that is really needed to succeed in, in a job, typically women are better in that uh, compared to physical economy. So there's a huge shift going on and we will see that uh, in the next 20 years. But it's not just the next 20 years and that's what I want to make clear in this slide. Um, because the feeling economy is already real. If you look in the US, what are the top fastest growing industries or fast growing industries that create jobs? They're all industries where feeling and empathy is super, super important. Think about personal care and service, think about healthcare, but also think about management. Management in essence is managing uh, people and um, being empathetic, being uh, a person that is part of the feeling economy is key in order to succeed. And the numbers are already showing that we're going into that direction. So to conclude these slides, what does it mean for the future? Well, we really believe at Sage that people are conversational. Now machines are too. And we can actually become human again. So everybody knows that this has been the evolution of um, uh, the human race. Well, we believe that by bringing conversational and AI together, we can finally be humans again. Um, and we're very proud to be part of that. And I think you can be very proud of that as well. Thank you for listening to my talk. And if you want to be in connection, let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. I think we have um, just a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. Um, if you can stay uh, to answer them, it would be great. So, Livia Pugliese says, in the Indian video, I just saw a recorded voice message on WhatsApp. How does a chatbot handle that? Um, there are multiple ways. Either you can do that live. Um, you can use speech-to-text and text-to-speech. So, we do that as well on, on the voice channels. So, you can just bring it on a telephone number. That's one way. Uh, another way uh, is on WhatsApp, where you use the recordings. We're currently uh, looking together with Meta how we can use our AI algorithms uh, on that piece as well. But um, then, of course, a, um, WhatsApp needs to open that uh, for, uh, for, for Sage. Uh, but we're looking at that as well uh, currently. So both are possible. Um, and we can also do it in WhatsApp uh, without using that recording function, but using another recording function. Perfect. And the last um, what question because of time, um, can Patrick Roland said, coincidentally, there is a worldwide outage of WhatsApp going on it, it seems. <laughs> How do you see dependence on one single cloud platform as a threat or opportunity? How will you solve that? So we're a communication platform as a service company with Sage, and it means that omni-channel um, and we would even say multi-model going forward. Um, and if you're interested in the concept multi-model, um, you should Google that once. It's, it's basically not having experience in one channel, but make sure that it goes seamless hand-in-hand uh, -hand between channels. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to talk more about it right now. Um, yeah, I, th I think the dependency on one channel is something that a CPaaS company, a communication platform as a service uh, like us, can solve because what we basically make sure is that you can use any channel that you want. And then on uh, outages or, or, or a, a single provider, I think this is just generally something that we need to accept from technology. I mean, your website can be down uh, as well. Um, your service can be unavailable. Um, that's something you just need to accept when you're uh, in the technology space. It doesn't mean that you should have all the time of your provider, um, but that's the reality. 
uh, 50 years ago, somebody could get ill and then you could not get a service behind the desk in real life. Uh, nowadays, the service can be out because there is a technical issue. But I think overall, if you look at the availability uh, of most of these channels, it's really, really high. Uh, it's 99 point and then five nines behind the comma. Um, but yeah, um, it's always good to diversify. Um, that's exactly what we, uh, what we can bring you. So if you, for instance, use chat layer, um, you can just uh, seamlessly move from WhatsApp to Apple Business Chat to Viber, etc. Uh, because we've built a platform like that. Um, so yeah, never put all your eggs in the same basket would be my advice. Um, right. But on the other hand, yeah, we also need to deal with some of the limitations that technology has. I agree. Uh, Rick, thank you very much for joining us this early. Now we have a, a really nice cup of coffee <laughs> and <laughs> from Brazil. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate uh, your time and uh, for joining us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you as well, Claudia. And uh, awesome to see all these people here in the event. Have a lovely day. I hope you enjoy. Uh, and uh, I hope to be in contact with many of you soon.